All right. Wow. Good to see you guys. Good to be seen. It's going to be like that today. Very quiet. I have, I have uh, um, something to share with you today, just so you know that what I hope, here's what I hope. This is my biggest concern about this is there's nothing worse, in my opinion, uh, than coming to church or going anywhere else, really, where the person who's talking is trying to answer questions that you don't even have. Or they're talking about something that you're going, this doesn't even have anything to do with me. So this is something that has been um, something that has been on my mind, on my heart. And what I'm hoping is, is that this isn't just like a thing for me. And I'm just talking to myself, but hopefully uh, that uh, hopefully I'm, I'm getting it right. And I think a lot of us are are, are dealing with some stuff and I want to address them today. I've been on what the fancy word is sabbatical. What it means is you just take a break, like unplug. I haven't been on the Internet. I haven't been. I uh, haven't been checking my mail or getting messages and, and stuff like that. And I realized something that, uh, that maybe I didn't realize before was, and the only, this is the only way I can equate it. Maybe if you've ever carried um, a, a load over time, so like a backpack, think of it this way, that if you were hiking for miles with a backpack, you kind of get used to the weight of the pack. You sort of carry it, and it's not until you take it off that you realize that it was pretty heavy in the first place. And I realize that, uh, that, that we've been marching through uh, these COVID times, right, uh, since 2020. And I realized, I think, when I kind of took the pack off, I was like, man, I thought I was dealing with stuff better than I was. You know, you know does that make sense? Like, I thought I was handling this way better than I, than I was, but when I took off the weight and I unplugged and I disconnected and I just said, you know what, it's, it's just, I'm just not going to think about those things. Um, that there was a weight there. And, and so then I said, okay, well, that's good to know, because at least if I know that, then I know that, one, I have to be careful personally not to be too confident in my own strength. Amen to that, right? That's my constant struggle. But, but also to realize that uh, we have to be careful not to um, stuff our packs full of things that don't need to be stuffed in there. So when you're going to carry a load, you only need to carry what you need to carry. You don't need to carry a bunch of stuff just to carry it. Does that make sense? Anybody ever been on a family vacation where they were overpacked? Uh, I, I laughed yesterday. This is just funny to me. I don't even know this guy, but um, I was at the beach yesterday with like 10,000 of our closest friends, right? Um, a lot of people, people everywhere, people bumping into each other in the water. There's a lot of people. And, uh, and as we were leaving, there was a guy in his truck, and he was unloading his truck into uh, one of these little wagons. And he, I, it looked like he had two kids and his wife. Um, but it, it, it also looked like they had about 12 chairs, three coolers, 17 floats, life jackets. And I'm, and I'm sitting there thinking, and I laughed, and I said this to my wife. I said, man, it's fun to see these young husbands that haven't learned to tell their wife no yet. Right? <laughs> Like, I used to do that, and finally, at some point, I'm like, look, we don't need 12 chairs. Like, if one breaks, I'll come get another one. We don't need to pack all this stuff, you know? So I just laughed about that anyway. But it kind of went with what I was thinking about anyway, which is like, you just t- bring what you need. Bring what you need. Don't, don't overstuff your pack with things that will weigh you down, and, and you just don't need to carry them, all right? So I probably could just end there for some of us, right? That's, that's really what it ends up for me. But... Uh, because you came to hear something, and hopefully more from God than me, then I want to share this with you. I thought to myself, I said, okay, um, I'm going through the time I'm going through, the things that I'm going through. You're going through the things you're going through, and the time that you're in at the same time. Uh, and I thought about the fact that, that even though everything to us feels unique, it's really not. Uh, the scripture tells us there's nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, there will always be a calamity. There will always be an issue. It will always be, whether we realize it or not, there are always unsure times. So I thought this week, what would I say if I had one conversation that I could sit down and have with my sons um, where I could tell them some things that might help them regardless of what the times that they'll face will look like. Because I don't know what my son's life looks like. Obviously, I hope that it, is, it far outlasts mine. But I don't know what it looks like when he's got children. And, 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 and what does life look like for them? Um, it looks right now to me like it will look different than it did for me. Probably for you. It already does in many ways. But what can I tell him 
from the standpoint of lasting truth that would help him navigate the times that he's in. And so I came up with three things, three sure things for unsure times. Amen? So we'll share that. I'll just share some scripture mainly and some thoughts with you on that. Can we pray? Uh, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your word, uh, for the stability it brings us, uh, for the confidence it brings us, for the wisdom it brings us, for the life it brings us. And so, Father, as we share out of your word today, pray that your Holy Spirit would be the loudest voice in the room. Speak to each and every person, every person that hears it here in the room, online, anywhere, anytime. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll add just the right truth to it so that it helps somebody navigate the situation they're in. I just ask that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right. So again, please don't let me answer questions that you're not asking. So if you're somebody, you're like, hey, man, I don't feel like anything's unsure. I'm good to go. Um, well, take a nap. Surf the web. Uh, maybe post some stuff on social media. Because I think the truth of the matter is, is that those of us who have our eyes open, we know things are unsure, right? Um, we can dance around that all we want to, but around our nation, um, in the world, I mean, you got everything that's going on from, from, from right now, you know, the headlines, Afghanistan and everything that's happening over there. You've got riots still here. You've got um, arguments about everything from critical race theory, um, and, and education, and, and COVID, and vaccines, and lockdowns, and mandates, and rights, and this, and that, and the other, and if you don't watch yourself, you can get on that little thing that's called a phone for whatever reason. It's not even a phone anymore. Um, mind control device. I don't know what you want to call it, but, but you can just stay on that. They just, wow, and just, you know, you can take in all of the calamity, and all the stress, all that you want. It's like a, it's like a smorgasbord of, of whatever you want to find out, read about, have told to you, you can get it right on that thing that we call a phone for some reason. And the truth of the matter is, is that it's hard to find out what the truth is. Because for every expert that says it's left, there's another expert that says it's right. For every expert that says it's up, there's another that says it's down. And you can just pick your expert, find a truth, latch onto it, and be dragged into what I would say the main stressor that I feel is that these are the most divisive times that I have lived through. Now, I'm old in some people's estimation, but in some of your estimation, I would think not, right? Uh, but nonetheless, man, we are, we are in times where the divide between people, it's just you can divide along every line every line, and if you're different than me, then you hate me, and I must hate you. And I think that, the, there, that these truths right here that I want to share with you can help you navigate particularly this push and pull. I'm not saying don't be opinionated. You should be educated. You should be wise. You should, you should be knowledgeable about all the things that are going on. You shouldn't stick your head in the sand and just hope it turns out all right. But you also shouldn't obsess about them. You also shouldn't put your hope and trust in them. You should always keep focused on how God says to live because in that, there's peace. Outside of that, there's no peace. Make sense? Somebody nod their head. Or I'm thinking I'm talking to somebody else. Like, okay, good. At least somebody's out there struggling like me, right? Um, well, here are your three things. I'm going to give you the, the gist of them first, and then I'm going to give you scriptures. First one, uh, I would tell my son, don't. Don't forget to do this, son. Make sure you get together with other believers. Make sure you get together with other believers. Amen. The other thing you need to do is you need to close the gap between you and the Lord. Constantly close the gap. And lastly, you need to learn how to fight right. You need to learn how to fight right. Fight the right way. And so I'm going to give you some scriptures that, that will help you along in this, right? Uh, where it says get together... And you can follow along on the screen. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. This is Hebrews 10. Uh, and I'm giving you some context in these verses, not just one, because I want you to sort of see what he's saying. It says, And so, dear brothers, uh, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. 
So it's interesting that he leads off that way, right? He's, he's getting ready to tell them not to, don't, don't stop getting together. But he starts that out by saying, listen, we can boldly enter, enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. This is tabernacle language, so uh, you know if, if you're new, that's not going to make a bit of sense to you. Don't get tripped up on it. But the way that they used to worship, the one place to encounter God was the most holy place. It was, it, it was a place that only the priests could go. And so what we're seeing here is saying that, look, Jesus opened that up, and now we have access to that place. And, and since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, Jesus, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed, listen, in pure, uh, pure water, right? So, so think of it this way. That all of the things that hinder you and I from going into that secret place, that most holy place, the thing that makes you think somehow that you're not acceptable to God, that ugly little sin that nags you, you know, anybody with me? Anybody ever hear that voice? The, the writer here, before he even tells them about being with one another, he tells them the reason that we're different. It's because we've been made clean through Christ, right? Right? In Christ, I'm clean. Clean. And he's telling me that our, even my body has been washed pure, washed with pure water. So it says this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. What do we hold to? The hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. And he says, let us think about ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So I'm not trying to tell you that, I, I can tell you this, that Jesus' return is nearer than it was yesterday. That's all I got, though. That's all I can tell you, right? Uh, because it's easy to go, oh, you know, this has got to be the end time, but man, I imagine there have been times when they've said it was the end time. And if you study the prophetic, there are a lot of people that are very, very convinced that these are those times. Um, and they're really smart. Um, and I say this, I say I've, I've never, you know, it sounds funny because I'm a pastor and I, I love studying this stuff. But uh, I also like studying things that I can figure out and I can't figure it. All I know is that nobody knows the time or the hour and it doesn't matter except to be ready. Amen. So, so be ready, right? And how can I be ready? I can live rightly. I can, I can live my life by the word that God gives me. And one of the things he tells me is that, is that when times are tough, right? When, 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 when the end is near and things are harder than they'll ever have been, he says to do what? Don't neglect getting together. Don't neglect one another. Don't neglect the strength that comes from the community that we call the church. You're the church. This is a building but the strength that comes from getting together with other believers, encouraging one another. What? To do good works, but also just encouraging one another. Because you can, you can listen to all kinds of people with all kinds of bad news, all kinds of stuff, but where are you going to be encouraged at? And I would say this, that as believers, we should be some of the most encouraging people on the face of the planet. And he tells us why. Because we have hope. We have hope. For some reason, about five minutes after I start talking, this microphone starts acting crazy. I'll figure it out. So, so don't neglect getting together. I, I could probably come up with all kinds of things, but I'll say this. Ask yourself this. Do you feel better after you get, get together with other believers? I do. I say this, and people probably think I say it just because I'm up here on stage, but, but there really isn't a place I'd rather be. I always leave encouraged after I come together with other believers. Does this, does this make sense? Because it's something that God has designed. 
that, that we come together and we laugh together, cry together, pray together, hope together, uh, we mourn together, we do all these things together, and in that togetherness, there's an exchange of life that happens that the Scriptures tell us, don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. And I'll just come out and say it, a lot of people neglected it, particularly over COVID. Now, I understand if you go, hey, man, I don't want to come into a, a big giant room open with people and I don't want to get sick and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, did you come up with another way, right? Because now I'll just say this. I don't foresee us shutting the doors of the church anytime. But there have been places in our nation where the doors have been shut for the church. What happens if they do that? What happens if that happens? You have to understand that you have to have a community of believers that you can go to because a community of believers is two or three, not two or three hundred, not 20 or 30. Who do you have? Where are your relationships with other believers? People that encourage you, that you encourage, that you do all these things called life with because in it, the assembling together, worshiping, praying, sometimes eating. We love to eat, right? Eating's easy. Studying, reading God's word. When those things happen, something's happening that's bigger than all those things individually. And I would say never forsake your Christian relationships and community. Make them important. Make them important. No matter what's going on in whatever time, don't give it up. Amen? Next, I said you got to close the gap. Close the gap. In Philippians 4, we see the Apostle Paul. Now, I want you to get the context of, of Philippians. Philippians was written in a time, uh, most scholars agree, it was written right about the exact time that the emperor Nero was feeding Christians to uh, starving lions in the arena for entertainment. He was burning them alive as torches for banquets. And so I would say, now this is just my opinion, that's probably worse times than we're in now. So, so we see where, where we think, oh, everything's horrible, but we're not being fed to lines that I know of, here anyway. Not being burned as torches. They were, and these are the Apostle Paul's words to the people in this area. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you, and I long to see you. Again, there's community, right? Dear friends, you, uh, uh, for you, dear friend, I want to see you, dear friends. For you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. So people are valuable. He says, now I appeal to Judea and Syntyche, I guess that's right. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. I, it's really weird to me that the Apostle Paul would, I mean, obviously he's writing, but he tells everybody, hey, look, Judea and Syntyche, two women, y'all, will y'all just settle your thing? Y'all just settle, you get, can you believe there were believers who disagreed on something? And Paul would just write it in a letter and air it out there for Scripture? It happens, y'all. You're not going to agree with everybody you go to church with. They're not going to agree with you on everything. But value one another more than you value being right. Value the fact that you have the one thing in common that matters more than anything else you can fight about, and that's the Lord. See, these weren't bad women. He turns around, he says, look. Oh, and he mentions, he said, I ask you my true partner, or, or Syzygus was this guy's name, um, to help these two women, because they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. These were not women that were running around causing discord. They weren't running around God. These were two hard-working, preaching women, and for whatever reason, they didn't agree with one another, and Paul's like, oh, can y'all please just get along? We have bigger things, bigger fish to fry. And so you may find yourself at odds with another believer or a group, a position of believers. Please take note of what Paul's saying here, and that is don't let these petty disagreements 
tarnish the one thing that you agree on more than anything else. And that sounds great in the Bible, but it is hard in real life, isn't it? Now, granted, people will take positions that are anti-scriptural. I'm not saying just look over those things. What I'm saying is, is if you have a petty disagreement with someone, please, please, as Paul mentioned about these two women, work hard to settle this thing. Work hard, because it's not as important as the testimony of the body of Christ loving one another more than they love everything that's going on in the world and being right. Make sense? They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. All these people are saved. We all work together. There's some disagreement. Please settle it. Please settle it. Why? Because you belong to the Lord. Then he turns around and he says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. I took this one verse and I made it my verse for days this week. Because I wasn't. If I'm being transparent, I tell you that it would have been hard to find an ounce of joy because I was irritated and frustrated and torn and wrestling with uh, some things that affect me personally, but, but also are bigger just issues, my opinion about that. How should my opinion about that affect the way I act? What should I do? Lord, what do I, where am I at? Where am I going? And where do you want me in all this? And I allowed those concerns to swap out. And, and you know what I didn't do? I didn't wake up every morning and, and thank the Lord for the health that I have. I didn't wake up and thank the Lord for the family I have. I didn't wake up and, and, and with a heart of gratitude about the things that are awesome in my life. And I was like focused on these little things that aren't awesome. And in comparison, they're different. This is so much, I have so much more to be grateful for than what I have not to be grateful for. And that's true of most of us. So always be full of joy in the Lord. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do. Boy, oh boy. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Interesting choice of words there. Don't worry about anything. And this is the big deal. This is what I would say. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. How do I face everything that's going on? How do I do it? Don't worry about it. Be prayerful about it. Tell God what you need and thank him for everything that he's done. That was true for Paul talking to the Philippians who are being fed to lions. And it's true of you and I who are in unsure times. It's hard to worry about something that you've really given to God. It's hard to. Because if you really trust Him, and you really believe He's going to be on your side, then you can trust the outcome to whatever it comes to be. Because you trusted Him. Some of it, really, guys, in all of the, the, um, I don't even know what to call it, chaos, craziness, uh, noise, distraction, in all of what we're dealing with, As believers, as citizens of this country, all the things that we're facing, we need to remember to be prayerful about. Here's what the Lord basically said to me, not audibly, but said to me, that, that before you're vocal about one thing, you better be vocal to me first. In other words, before you go ranting, raving, taking positions and all that, all those things should land on my desk before they land anywhere else. It gets posted to me before it gets posted to anyone. Amen? Why? Why? Why should it be that way? Because if I'm so concerned about it that I feel the need to go on blast about it, then I should at least allow my opinion to be informed by by the one who actually knows what's up. And when I did that, I realized something, and y'all may too. I didn't think I, I was like, I'm not as concerned about the things after I talked to God about them. 
After I pray about them, something happens in me and I feel less need to wring my hands over it, to worry about it. It's like, it's almost like God's all-powerful and all-knowing and that He wants me to have peace. And so when I come and I bring it to Him and He assures me that it will be okay regardless of what okay looks like, then I can relax. But I'll give you this little hint. You will stay frustrated if you go to God and tell Him what He needs to do. You you can have more peace if you go to Him and say, you know, God, my lawnmower is broke. You know I love my lawnmower. You know I don't want to spend money on my lawnmower. Please fix my lawnmower. I'm painting God into a a place where he either has to do what I want him to do or or he didn't care. When maybe God just wanted me to have a different lawnmower. Or maybe it was time. Maybe that lawnmower was going to blow up in a fiery crash with me on it. And he's trying to save me from it. And I'm telling him, no, 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 you got to do this. Versus saying, you know what, Lord, ah, man, my my lawnmower's broke. My, My heart is broken because my lawnmower's broke. And I really love my lawnmower. But Lord, you know best. You know best. And I don't know what to do, but I'll listen and I'll pay attention. And whatever you tell me to do, I'll go with that. Whatever you want to do in it. I'm ready to do what you want to do. If you take that approach to things, then, then you're actually inviting the Holy Spirit in to prepare your heart for whatever you'll face. Versus telling God what he needs to do and only looking for that one thing. Because it sets us up to miss it. And if you didn't like that, that was good to me. Because that wasn't in my notes. Thank you. All right. Anyway. Uh, Look, I'm sitting here thinking about my thing while I'm talking to y'all. And I forgot where I was. Here we go. Verse 7. Then you'll experience God's peace. Anybody want that? Sign me up, right? God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So you don't get to go and live like hell and want heaven to occupy you. You can't do it. You can't go hating your neighbor. You can't go on worrying and you can't go on uh, just, just raging and, and ranting and, and living that way and then, and, then, and then shaking your head going, God, I have no peace. I don't understand it. Well, let his peace come in. Let it guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Simultaneous, right? Make your relationship with him most important. Close the gap. Get close to Christ. Then you'll have the peace of Jesus that exceeds everything you can imagine. Make sense? So don't don't stop getting together with believers. Close the gap between you and the Lord and let his peace reign. And finally, fight right. Fight right. Um, I am generally a peaceful person. But to be honest with you, I do like to fight. I do. I used to like to fight physically. Then as you get older, that stuff hurts way more, right? So I'm, I'm done with that. Like, if you punch me in the face, now I'm just going to cry. You see, I'd be like, hit me with a baseball bat. I'm still coming at you. And I probably was. But now it's like, man, don't even, don't even thump my nose because I'm just going to cry about it. It's like. But what shifted is, is that is, is that I know now that I'm, that that fighting part of my spirit is more fighting for the truth and what the Lord says and fighting for people who've been deceived. Now, don't, please don't go into some political category or current event. What I'm talking about is being deceived and being robbed of the truth of what Christ did for them. Okay? 
It's really easy when we read the scripture to inject our current reality into it. And so when, when, when we talk about particularly the passages that we're going to get into, I want you to understand when we talk truth, we're talking about eternal truth, right? Eternal truth. Now, now the enemy will use current situation to erode eternal truth. So it doesn't mean that you, can't, you can just say, like, I'm just going to ignore everything that's going on. Through everything that's going on, people are being robbed of eternal truth. That's how the enemy works. So he works in what's going on naturally to create supernatural uh, distance between people and God. And so you have to understand uh, that, that while the era you're living in, the moment you're living in matters greatly, uh, it matters more that you understand that there's always a bigger fight going on than what it looks like. The enemy's always trying to rob you of peace. He's always trying to kill your joy. He's always trying to steal the relationships you have one with another. Always, always, always. And he don't care. He'll use critical race theory. He'll use uh, theological positions of people in churches. He'll use the color of your shirt if he can use it. And he will rip relationships apart. And he'll create division. And he'll rob you of peace. And he'll do all those things because he hates you. And he wants you dead. And he doesn't want any of the Lord's peace to reign in your life. And so now we say, okay, so how then do I fight for what's right? You can actually fight about, I should say, well, if you do it right, you can call it fighting for the truth in a situation. You can do that. You should do that. You are God's perspective and his mouthpiece about things that are wrong. If someone tells me that I should hate someone based off of anything, I can tell them that that's not true. There's no problem with that, right? Right? And the reason I'm not being specific in that is that you, you, you could say, like, I shouldn't hate. It's amazing to me that we're still saying that we shouldn't hate each other based off the color of our skin. When did we not learn that along the way, right? It, it is true. But the fact of the matter is also true that even if I run into someone who does hate me based off of the color of my skin, I can't hate them. Because hate's the bigger issue. Are we, are we making sense? That, that, that there's a greater truth that we're always talking about. And as believers, you've got to realize and, and discern where are those greater truths that we're discussing. Where are those things that we're really talking about? Because if someone hates me while they tell me about hate, then I'm not sure I want to take it from them. Because they haven't solved the bigger problem there's still hate. The antidote to hate is not a different kind of hate. The antidote to hate is the love of Christ. Right? Because I'll tell you what, you can hate people for anything. I, was, I have a long list that I can go down, but, you know, you can hate them because they're clothes, you can hate them because of an accent, you can hate them because of the country they're from, you can hate them for their driving, you can hate them because they cut in front of you in line. You can hate them for being in line. You can hate them, you know, because they're taking up the space that you want to be in. You can hate them, hate them, hate them. You know? We have no problem coming up with a reason to be angry and, dis and spiteful and hateful to anybody. But we're called to love. Right? So anytime you encounter it, encounter it with the antidote for it that is from God's word. Don't just come up with some argument about it. you shouldn't do that. And if you keep doing it, I'm going to hate you too. Well, you're not teaching the truth. Philippians 8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, did I just back up? No, I'm going to fight right. Yeah, I never even finished that one. Never mind. Skip, let's skip over. Let's go to 2 Timothy. I totally just left out a bunch of scripture, but it's okay. We're already on this thing. Fight right. 2 Timothy, because I want you to see this in scripture more than just taking it from me. Right? My opinion doesn't matter. Scripture matters. How do you fight right? 2 Timothy 2, 22 talks about this. It says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. In other words, you know what? Everybody deals with all of the basic, uh, uh, I don't know, lusts. The things that we want, right? Lust of the flesh, you know, lust for whatever. Run from that stuff. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, 
love, and peace. What should we be pursuing? Right? Should we always pursue being right? Because I didn't catch that in there. I, I didn't see where that was one of the things that I should pursue. It says I should pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Right? Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Again, there's another uh, shout out to community, right? Enjoy it. Enjoy one another as believers. And then he says this. And this is Paul. This is funny. It's his letter to Timothy, but he's, he's a guy who spends his adult life debating people and teaching people and telling people. And I thought, well, this is an interesting thing for Paul to say, but you know what? Paul fought right. Paul fought with wisdom. He fought with God's words, the Spirit working through him, with wisdom, understanding. But even he said, not even with the most eloquent words, because that's not what he's trying to do. He's just trying to give people the truth. But he says this, don't get involved in these kind. This is the kind of fights you don't want to get involved in. Ignorant, <laughs> foolish, ignorant arguments. How many of us have been drawn into foolish, ignorant arguments that starts fights? Boy, I have. And I don't know why it bothers me so much for somebody to be wrong. It drives me crazy. Why do I care if you're wrong, right? Why do I care if you like red hot dogs instead of brown hot dogs? You know, and I'm sorry if you're online and you don't get that one. It's like a big thing, right? It's like Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts, you know? You can create this huge uproar over these things, right? And I'm going, I can't stand for you to not like or want or enjoy what I like, want, and enjoy. You need to be right. What is right? Most of the time, right is like me. Because I'm right. To me. And I get drawn into... Foolish, ignorant arguments that cause fights. When realizing that, listen, if I'm going to fight, at first, I, and what Paul's saying here is you need to fight about the right thing, right? Don't fight about stupid stuff. Ignorant, foolish arguments. Don't do it. It's scripture, by the way. This isn't me. This isn't me telling you to. Stop fighting about stupid stuff. This is Paul. He's saying, don't do it. It only starts vice. Why? Because of this. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. I don't know if you've ever seen difficult people, but I have. Usually it's the people that aren't right, like me. Hopefully you're getting my sarcasm here, right? Difficult people. You mean that Scripture is telling me to not quarrel and have ignorant, stupid fights, but be kind, teach, and be patient with people who are wrong. Yes. You read it, I just read it, and it's still true. Why? Because if you, I invite this for anyone that ever hears this message, that, that goes at someone and says, and I'll just pick a big one. Let's say uh, you're a Democrat and you, and you want people to be Democrats, or if you're a Republican, either way, whatever, Right? Uh, let's, let me change it so I don't offend anybody. Um, and, and I'm mixing it up so nobody really knows what I'm talking about, right? Ostrich or elephant, right? If I'm an ostrich, uh, I want everybody to be an ostrich. If I'm an elephant, I want everybody to be... Well, no, the elephant's a, re a political thing, isn't it? Man, <laughs> preaching is hard these days, y'all. It's hard because I'm not trying to say anything political, but everybody just puts it in my mouth, you know? If I want to be a speaker, like a speaker, or if I want to be a podium, right? Podium wants everybody to be a podium. Speaker wants everybody to be a speaker. Have you ever seen or heard of a podium 
yelling at a speaker and saying, you need to be a podium. This is why you need to be a podium. And the speaker says, I don't want to be a podium because podiums just stand around. And they don't do anything. They just hold up some stuff. They're not complicated like a good speaker. And the podium says, no, you're wrong. This is why you should be a podium. And the speaker turns around and says, you know what? You're right. I agree with you now. Suddenly, I agree with you. And I want to be a podium. Anybody ever seen that? Anybody ever seen anybody just shift and go, you know what? You're right. Maybe that's never been posted on Facebook. You know what? You're right. I'm going to change everything that I believe about this thing just because you told me. Thank you. Probably never been done. You know what I have seen done? I have seen non-quarrelsome conversations between people where someone teaches the truth over time and the person begins to move in the direction of the truth. I was that guy. I was the guy who denied that God existed at one point in my life. I was the guy who was sitting in church kind of like mocking. Like I remember going to play golf with the pastor of the church that I was going to at the time. And I, asked, I said, are you seriously going to tell me? And then I ripped off every weird thing in the Old Testament, right? Seriously going to tell me every animal fit on a boat? Are you seriously going to tell me a guy lived 900 years? Are you seriously going to tell me a virgin gave birth? Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? Right? And he didn't look at me and say, you're a fool. Get out of my golf cart. We're never talking again. You either be a Christian or get away from me. He didn't do that. He said, man, I've had questions like that. Man, some of those things are still question marks to me. But let me tell you the truth. Let me give you what's useful. And you know what? Eventually, the truth built up in me. And enough questions were actually answered. And I moved from a person who was ruled by a lie to a person who received the truth. And in that truth, salvation, life, life eternal. And so when I say this to you, and when Paul's writing this to you, it is life and death serious that you don't get, you don't get pulled into this idea of fighting and raging and cutting down and cutting short and cutting off people who don't believe in the truth because the truth matters more than anything. So don't give up on people, even difficult people, because I've been difficult people. I've been very difficult people. And I'm thankful that there, was, there were people along the way that abided by what Paul said here, and they were gentle, and they were not quarrelsome, and they pursued peace, but they also were willing to teach me the truth. I'm grateful to those people. But no one's ever won me over in an argument. With volume, they've never won me over in an argument just because they said so. It just doesn't work. Doesn't work for me, probably won't work for you, and it probably won't work for those other difficult people, will it? So let's do it God's way. Let's fight right. He goes on to say, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. How? How? Hit them in the head with a bat, yell at them, scream at them, belittle them, call them stupid, post incessant amounts of information for them to be changed? No. Gently instruct them. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they'll learn the truth. Perhaps. Then they'll come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they've been held captive by him to do whatever he wants, which is, by the way, the definition of difficult people. People who are doing what the devil wants, right? Just disagreeing with me doesn't make them difficult. They're being ruled by a lie. And so if you encounter those people, you have to love those people. So I would say to my sons, don't stop getting together with your Christian friends. Build a community. 
of people who encourage you and tell you the truth, love you, do life with you, do this big exchange that happens when we as believers are involved in the life of one another. And make sure you close the gap between you and God. Make sure you stay close. Make sure that everything that comes out of you runs through him first. Be in prayer. Don't worry about stuff. Keep close. And then, son, you're going to have to fight. I want to say it was C.S. Lewis said that Christianity is a warring religion. And I agree with him. It's not for wimps. You got to do battle, but you got to remember who you're doing battle with. You're fighting an enemy, you're not fighting a person. Now, the person may embody the enemy and do the bidding of the enemy, that's true. But remember that the war isn't won between you and the other person, the war is won in the spirit. The war is won in what's unseen before it'll show up in what's seen. My prayer is, is that, and, and if I'm honest, I'll tell you this, that I've watched. What breaks my heart in all this is not that there's confusion. That doesn't surprise me. It's not that there's division. That doesn't surprise me. It, it's not that there's disagreement. It's not that there's, and you can just keep going on. Those things don't surprise me. Probably what has surprised me the most is the amount of burden and suffering amongst God's people when the reality is, is that it's in times like this that your light and my light shines bright. It's, it's, it's that everyone wants to fight me, with me, but why do you love me? Everyone wants to beat me up for where I'm at, but, but you seem to be pursuing peace, showing me love, trying at least... I'll tell you this. I know people that are in strong disagreement with what I believe. But they're also a little bit thrown off by the fact that I won't push them away because I know that they disagree. I still value them, still respect them, still love them. Why? Because perhaps, perhaps, the Lord will bring them to a place where the truth becomes more clear. So guys, we can't be, we can't act just any old way. We have to settle the differences between believers. We have to learn. We have to understand that you can't be ruled by the chaos that's ruling the world. That God's given you a greater peace to live in, to live in you through Christ Jesus. So if you've been struggling, these are great on paper. Um, maybe I'll update you because I'm still working them out, right? These are, these are things for me that I'm, this is not like, I got this. I just realized a couple weeks ago I didn't have this. I just realized that I'm, I'm in as much uproar as anything, you know? I got the Ken News Network playing in my head all the time, Right? What's going on? What's happening? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And it's exhausting. When the reality is, is that the Lord gives you wisdom to deal with everything that you're going to deal with. That God's not going to be overcome by the world. It doesn't happen. And you don't have to have that in your life. So my prayer for you is that you don't have it in your life. That you inherit exactly what you should inherit, which is life, peace, hope, courage, and wisdom. And that those things begin to rule in your life if you've been struggling like I've been struggling. Amen? Would you stand with me? Remember, I said I like a good fight. If you're like me, then fight for your peace. Fight for your hope. Fight for your relationships. Fight in prayer. Fight, fight, fight. Don't lay down. God didn't save you so you could be laid on the ground and run over by the enemy. That's not why he saved you. He saved you 
to be part of his family, to be his representatives, to be his sons, and to, de to declare the truth in a world where the truth it just takes a beating. So do that. Be that. If you don't know how to do it, find a friend. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've mentioned this, but you know, most of y'all see those little signs we have up in the bathroom, right? It's like, hey, take the challenge. Like, have lunch with somebody. Hi, meet somebody. Like, hey, you want to go to lunch? I see we go to church together. Maybe that's how you know. I don't know. Hopefully not, right? But work on the community. Make the friendships. Build life together. Amen? There's strength in it. And Father, I just pray for your people. God, I thank you for their hearts, for their desire to please you. Now, God, I just pray that you'll shower each and every person with the peace that comes from life in your son. Father, I just pray, God, that as we leave, God, that we'll be unburdened. Lord, that where we may have come in heavy, we leave light. God, that we don't stuff our backpacks with stupid stuff that weighs us down, but that we march on and that we, that we war on for you, for your kingdom, for your truth, and for those people who don't know it yet, that they might be saved. Now, Father, I just pray that you will empower your people to do it. God, give us the wisdom, the courage, and the strength it takes to not be quarrelsome and petty, but to act like we know who our Father is in heaven and that we know that we've already won every battle that we face in your name. It's that that you'll do that for us, in us, and then maybe even work it out through us to other people. I ask that in Jesus' name. If you agree with me, say amen. 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 Love you guys. Thanks for being here. We will see you soon, I hope. <laughs>